News of the Times. Mad, bad, and dangerous to know. Welcome to our new series focusing in depth on famous crime stories of their day. Each week, we focus on a crime story renowned in its time. Information is derived from historical publications. Today's episode focuses on Francois Quavazier, a Swiss valet who emigrated to England and settled in London. This episode is unusual in that several of the gruesome crimes laid at his door are retrospective. Francois Quavazier was not a direct suspect at the time. A possible template for the Jack the Ripper murders of 50 years later places Francois Quavazier under the category of mad, bad, and dangerous to know. We hope you enjoy the show. Francois Quavazier, known murders 1, suspected additional murders 3. Like Many news stories we cover, it often happens that the murderers of crimes become known retrospectively. This is one such case. Although Corvazier was never tried or possibly suspected of the crimes at the time, it has been strongly hypothesized by several historians that he was guilty of the brutal slashings of three victims in London prior to the murder which he was convicted of. The crime that Quavazier was tried for and found guilty of was the murder of his employer, or master, Lord Russell, which was a serious enough offence in 1840. In reviewing the Quavazier case, we will assume the historians to be correct and will review the slayings that occurred although he was not charged with those offences. Fifty years before the Ripper was stalking the streets of Whitechapel, Francois Covazier was slitting throats with hooks in London. Like the Ripper, Covazier had a penchant for prostitutes. Like the Ripper, his preferred method was slashing. Like the Ripper, his victims were found drenched in their own blood with their throats slit, and the murders took place in London. The Corvazier crimes were so famous in their day that Charles Dickens attended Corvazier's execution. He was said to have inspired and used the outline of one of the killings to describe the death of Nancy in Oliver Twist. Victim 1 Eliza Davis, murdered May the 9th, 1837. Eliza Davis, originally Welsh, was a respectable barmaid for a local tavern in the Whitechapel area. She was known as a reliable worker and had been working at the same tavern for some seven to eight years. She had considerable savings that were found in the trunk in her room. She had no boyfriends and was known to have a sober disposition. Her murder was the start of several murders in the area during the time, several slashings of the windpipe with several additional stab wounds. From the Weekly Chronicle, 14th of May, 1837. The full particulars of the horrid murder of Eliza Davis. It appears that the unfortunate victim had lived about six months with the present landlord, but had held the same situation under the former proprietor, Mr. Berry, for a period of seven or eight years. She was a native of Wales and was much esteemed for her steadiness and attention to the house. It was customary for her to rise early, and on the morning in question she rose about six o'clock, and having procured the keys from her master, she went downstairs and proceeded to unlock the place 
before anyone in the house was stirring. About 20 minutes afterwards, a mechanic named Hale, residing in the same street, passed by and, seeing the door open, went in for the purchase of procuring a glass of beer. He called out but could make nobody hear. He then looked over the counter and was horrified at perceiving the door of the bar deluged with blood. He ran to the staircase and gave the alarm, and in a few seconds the pot boy, Jones, came running down, half-dressed, and in his progress he stumbled over the body of the deceased, which was lying on a mat on the landing at the top of the first flight. Lights having been procured, the deceased was examined, when a frightful gash was perceived on the right side of her throat, which had completely severed the windpipe, the cartoid and other arteries, so that life must soon have been extinct. She was lying on a rope mat, saturated with her blood. In a few minutes afterwards, Sergeants Moody and Glandian of the S Division arrived. The body was raised, carried into the first floor front room and placed on a table. Surgical aid was then sought for when Drs. Swain and Johnson of Albany Street promptly attended, but of course could be of no service in restoring vitality, the unfortunate young creature being quite dead, although the body was warm. The shutters, which to this time were up, were now taken down, when a strict examination of the premises took place. The counter was found sprinkled with blood, which was traced along the bar floor up to the stairs to the place where the helpless victim sank down to rise no more. Attention was next directed to the door leading into the street, where the bloody marks of apparently a man's fingers were distinctly seen on it, but no blood could be traced along the floor leading in that direction, which, if the deceased had cut her own throat, would not have been the case. A bloody table knife was found near the spot in which the sanguine deed was no doubt, perpetrated. It is the opinion of the medical gentleman alluded to and other persons capable of forming an opinion that the ill-fated young woman had been suddenly seized by the murderer while her back was turned on him behind the counter, and that while in that situation he forcibly drew her head towards him and committed the horrid deed after which he hastily withdrew, leaving evidence of the sanguinary work on the door as already described. The object which the ruffian had in view does not appear, as she had no sweetheart or followers, and the motive could not have been plunder, as a quantity of money and other property remained in the bar untouched. Mr. Henry Barton of No. 18 William Street, Regent's Park, stated, I was called to attend the deceased about quarter before seven o'clock on Tuesday morning and found her lying on the landing place. The left side of her face was visible. I examined her and found that she was quite dead. There was a wound in the throat beginning on the left side and extending about three inches across the throat, dividing the windpipe and the whole of the muscles on that side of the neck. The cartoid artery and jugular vein were also divided. The soft parts of the neck were cut through to the vertebrae. Death resulted from the wound. From the appearance of the wounds, I am of opinion that the deceased did not inflict the wound herself. She must have been left-handed if she did. The wound must have been inflicted with great violence, 
and must have been done with two strokes or more. The knife produced is such an instrument as would inflict a wound of that description. I think it probable that the first cut was inflicted in the bar and the man followed her through to the kitchen and cut her a second time as she was going to the stairs. A suspect. In this first murder, a number of potential suspects were named. But what is particularly noted is the search for a foreign man. Certainly London was rife with foreign men, but this one was repeatedly described as tall, thin and well-dressed. He was described as approximately 29 years of age and was described as French. Although Courvoisier was Swiss, French was his primary language. The crime created considerable interest in the neighbourhood, with many looking out for the tall, thin, foreign stranger, but he eluded everyone and seems to have vanished. Victim 2. Eliza Grimwood, May 27, 1838. In contrast to Eliza Davis and her sterling reputation, Eliza Grimwood was a known prostitute, albeit for a higher class of clientele. She lived with her partner, who was her cousin, in the lodging house, which also accommodated other lodgers. The front room of her apartments was set up as a bedroom. Eliza, described as an exceptionally attractive woman, was in the habit of attracting her clients from the theatre. Her flats were a short cab ride away. The murder of Eliza Grimwood is similar to the murder of Eliza Davis. As with Eliza Davis, the first victim, a tall, thin foreign man was seen to be in her company shortly before she was found murdered. From the Examiner, the 3rd of June, 1838. The murder of Eliza Grimwood. A very shocking murder perpetrated under circumstances which have increased the interest always created by such things has spread through town during the past week, much curiosity and excitement. The report of the alleged murder was first given by a man lodging at number 12 Wellington Terrace, Waterloo Road, who at six o'clock on Saturday morning, the 26th, was observed to run out of the house calling police and ejaculating that a murder had been perpetrated. At the end of the terrace, the man alluded to policeman 31L, and having appraised him that a female had been murdered, he, the policeman, immediately proceeded to the house, and on entering the back parlour, which is fitted up as a bedroom, he beheld a female apparently about 25 years of age lying on the floor with her throat cut in a dreadful manner and quite dead. The room was deluged in blood. The body was lying near the entrance into the room, and there were several cuts or gashes across her hands, as if she had struggled against her assailant. It appeared that the unfortunate woman, whose name was Eliza Grimwood, and who was a remarkably handsome young female, had been, for some length of time, living with a man at the house in Wellington Terrace, and that, independently of that circumstance, she was in the habit of frequenting the theatres and taking home gentlemen. On those occasions, when she was accompanied home by a friend, the man with whom she lived retired to another bed in the same house, in which it also appears that there are other lodgers. On Friday, she left home in the early part of the afternoon and returned at twelve o'clock the same night, when her servant, a young girl, perceived that she was accompanied by a gentleman. Having gone upstairs from the kitchen without a candle, 
the maid asked her, Eliza Grimwood, if she would return downstairs and strike a light. Her mistress, however, desired her to go to bed, adding that she would get a light for herself, as she knew in what part of the room the tinderbox was to be found. As this conversation took place in the dark, in the passage of the house, the servant had no opportunity of distinguishing the features of the person by whom her mistress was accompanied, but she describes him to be a well-dressed man, rather tall and of gentlemanly appearance, as far as the night enabled her to see. She, the servant girl, then went downstairs, and she heard her mistress and the gentleman enter the parlour, which is the bedroom, and shut and lock the door after them. The servant girl, however, says that she heard no noise during the night, and that the first imitation that she had that her mistress was murdered was on hearing the man with whom the deceased had been living and who slept in the house giving the alarm at six o'clock in the morning. The Inquest The jury, having been sworn, proceeded to view the body of the deceased, which was lying on the floor in the position in which it was first discovered, in the back room on the ground floor, which she used as a bedroom. The body was near the door, and the head was nearly severed from its shoulders. Some deep cuts were also perceptible on her left hand, the thumb and second finger of which had scars across them, apparently as if she had thrown up that hand while her murderer was attacking her. She had all her clothes on with the exception of her gown, and it was quite apparent that her murder must have been perpetrated when she got out of bed, there having been impressions on the pillows in the bed, as if two persons had been lying down. Nothing in the room, however, appeared to have been disturbed, and although every diligence has been used to discover the weapon the murderer had used on the occasion, none has been found. From William Hubbard's evidence, the man who lived with the deceased, he stated that he did not get out of his bed during the night, neither did he hear any noise except that of the barking of a little dog in the house. The deceased, Eliza Grimwood, was perfectly sober when he saw her on Friday night at eight o'clock, and she was a young woman of remarkably sober habits. The surgeons were examined and disposed to the frightful wounds inflicted on various parts of the deceased. Mr. Cook, the surgeon, said that on Tuesday, in company with several other medical men, he examined the deceased, and in addition to the terrible wounds in the neck, there was also a stab two inches below the left nipple and about the third of an inch in depth. There was another stab in an oblique direction directly over the breastbone. There was another wound in the abdomen and one also at the back of the left ear. Mr. Cook the surgeon went on to say these latter wounds did not appear to have been inflicted by an instrument that cut clean. Neither of these wounds would have caused instant death. One of the wounds was inflicted by stabbing through the stays, and I imagine that the murderer seized hold of the top of the stays on the opposite side with his left hand. With the other hand, he then stabbed her downwards. I am also of opinion that the murderer must have turned up her clothes and, grasping the husk of her stays, stabbed her upwards with a view, as I think, of piercing 
her heart. There was no infusion of blood from these wounds, and I believe they were inflicted after life was extinct. I think that the wound on the back of the neck was perpetrated after that in the throat for the purpose of severing the head from the body. The coroner stated, I believe that the wounds in the neck were the cause of death. The wound on the back of the neck extended from ear to ear, and the vertebrae was divided. The person who committed the act must have had his hands covered with blood. I saw no discoloured water in the room. There were several statements from witnesses. They all described seeing Eliza with a man with the appearance of a gentleman. In this case, the partner, William Hubbard, was the primary suspect of Eliza's death, but it was not proven. Murder victim three, Robert Westwood, a watchmaker, murdered June the 3rd, 1839. Now, historians are torn as to whether to include Robert Westwood with the two previous victims, as he was clearly not a woman, and unlike in the previous two cases, there was a monetary gain as well in this crime. We include this crime with the speculation that, following the arguments of historians, Robert Westwood himself was quite a well-known watchmaker and clockmaker. He supplied watches and clocks to the royal family. He had been robbed several times and was robbed on this occasion, so police quite understandably focused on this crime primarily as a robbery. Once again, there is a mysterious, tall, thin, foreign chap who was known to have visited the store a few days prior. From the Argus on the 9th of June, 1839. Murder, robbery and arson. About 12 o'clock on Monday night, the inhabitants of Princess Street, Leicester Square, were thrown into a state of considerable alarm in consequence of loud screams of fire, which proceeded from the house of Mr. Robert Westwood, a watch and clockmaker at number 35 in the above street. The alarm, however, occasioned by the fire was greatly increased, and the utmost consternation prevailed when it was discovered that Mr. Westwood had been most brutally murdered and his mangled remains partially consumed by the fire. From the information collected, it appears that some years since, the house of Mr. Westwood was burglariously entered and property to a considerable amount stolen, and for which offence a person was subsequently executed at the Old Bailey. Since that period, Mr. Westwood has made it an invariable practice to sleep downstairs in a room at the back of the shop with a view to its better security. But Mrs. Westwood, lately in consequence of indisposition, has occupied a separate sleeping room upstairs. Immediately adjoining the shop is a parlour, usually occupied by the family, through which, and divided only by a slight partition, is another room which was occupied by the deceased as a bedroom. On Monday night, about eleven o'clock, Mrs. Westwood retired to bed, leaving the deceased in the parlour, about which time Mr. Gerard, a French gentleman, who occupied apartments in the house, returned home and was let in by the female servant, who, as usual, fastened the door for the night and then went upstairs to bed. Sometime after she was in bed, Mrs. Westwood fancied she heard a sort of scuffling in the passage, but which at the time she considered to be the deceased turning the cat out 
of the room, as was his general custom before he went to bed. In a minute afterwards, however, she heard a loud groaning which rather alarmed her and which was greatly increased by hearing this front street door slam. Mrs. Westwood instantly called the servant, who speedily ran downstairs and, on entering the parlour, was almost suffocated by a dense smoke, but did not discover any fire. She then proceeded to the street door, an opening which she saw a gentleman pass by, and she requested him to call out fire, she being unable to do so herself. On the alarm being given, several engines shortly arrived. On entering the room, the bed on which Mr. Westwood usually slept was discovered to be on fire, and the unfortunate gentleman himself lying on the floor, partly enveloped in the flames. He was instantly removed into the adjoining parlour when it was discovered that his throat was cut most dreadfully in two or three places. The firemen speedily succeeded in extinguishing the fire, and in the interim Mr. Smith, a surgeon residing in Dean Street, was sent for, who pronounced that the vital spark had fled, and that from the nature of the wounds death must have been almost instantaneous. But this time information had been conveyed to the police, and Superintendent Baker and Inspector Jarvis of the Sea Division immediately proceeded to search the rooms in order to find the instrument with which the diabolical deed had been inflicted, and after some search, an iron window weight measuring in length about 12 or 14 inches and weighing between 5 and 6 pounds was discovered in the passage leading to the street door. On examining this, a few hairs were discovered on one of its ends, and there seems to be no doubt but the wound of the eye was inflicted by this instrument, which must have been taken into the house by the murderer as no person in the house had ever seen it before. On further examination, a white-handled table knife was found in a drawer in a sideboard in the parlour, the blade of which was much stained with blood, and which bore evident marks of having been wiped. It was at first presumed that the premises had not been plundered, but on looking over the stock it was discovered that upwards of ninety of the most valuable watches had been stolen. There was an immense number of watches in the room from which all the most valuable had been selected and taken from different cases. The property taken away consisting of watches, chains, money, etc., is estimated to amount to about £2,000. From the circumstance of all the most valuable watches having been selected and the money taken from the tills, it is presumed that the murderer was well acquainted with the premises. Although the throat slitting and pool of blood are similar to the previous cases, the focus remained clearly on the goods taken and the case was handled as a robbery in progress that Robert Westwood had interrupted, thereby causing his death. Historians who include Westwood as one of Corvazier's victims seem to focus on the slashing, location and general time frame of similar crimes. Victim 4. The Right Honourable Lord W. Russell murdered May the 6th, 1840. Courvoisier was employed by Lord Russell as his valet. This crime, the killing of a member of the aristocracy, was its own version of the O.J. Simpson trial of the time, with keen interest in the case extending to Charles Dickens. 
An interesting side note. At the time of the investigation into the murder of Lord William Russell, the new Queen Victoria had also been attacked on the 10th of June 1840. Feelings regarding the perceived attempts at murdering the aristocracy ran high and further elevated the interest in the murder of Lord Russell. From the Brighton Gazette on the 7th of May, 1870. Shocking murder of Lord William Russell. The west end of the town was yesterday, Wednesday morning, thrown into a state of the greatest consternation by report that Lord W. Russell had the previous night been barbarously murdered in his house in Norfolk Street, Park Lane. On inquiry, the report was found to be too true, and the following are the particulars of the horrid affair as nearly could collect them. Lord William Russell retired to rest in good health at about half past twelve, when one of his maidservants yesterday morning proceeded to the entrance hall of the house. She was surprised to find behind the door his lordship's cloak folded up and a silver dish cover wrapped up in a cloth, which were also an opera glass, a silver pencil case, and two or three other small articles. She immediately gave alarm. The valet, who thereupon proceeded to Lord William Russell's sleeping apartment, with the intention of informing him that robbery had been committed. Opening the shutters of the bedroom, the valet was horror-stricken to find the sheets and bedclothes saturated with blood, and Lord William Russell lying his right side with his throat cut from ear to ear. There was a wet towel with which his lordship had washed himself on the previous night lying over his face, from which it was evident that could not have committed suicide. An alarm was instantly given, but it was some time before a police constable could be found in the immediate neighbourhood. A messenger was consequently dispatched to the police station, and on the arrival of the officers to the house, examinations were instituted. It was found that several places in which property was kept were broken open, and a great deal of the same valuable property taken away. Lord William Russell wore several valuable rings, and he had them on when he retired to rest that night. It was found that these rings had been removed from his fingers. His lordship's gold watch was also missing. The cases, the desks, etc., in all the principal rooms were broken open and a great part of their contents abstracted. From the appearance of the bedclothes, which were very little disturbed, it is clear that his lordship could not have made much, if any, resistance. There was no blood about any of the articles in the room, with the exception of the bed on one of the sheets, of which the murderer wiped his hands. No knife or razor or any other instrument has been found. They examined the nature of the wound, which they found to extend from ear to ear. It was evidently done with a razor or some sharp instrument. Immediate search was made for it, but none could be found. The deceased had been dead for some hours. The back door had been broken into, giving the appearance that the robbery took place from outside of the household. The cloak filled with expensive items was left by the door, and it was supposed that the robber had left it as he feared he would attract too much attention. Pressure on the police was extreme, as Lord Russell was closely tied to aristocracy, within Her Majesty's government, 
although he himself was a retired man of some seventy years of age. All members of the household were interviewed in detail with statements being taken. The cracks from Quervasier's statements, along with statements from other servants, began to point the finger towards Quervasier. Quervasier had only been in the employ of Lord Russell for five weeks. From the Globe, the 8th of May, 1840. A good deal of jealousy existed, it is stated, in the bosom of Quervasier in consequence of the kindness shown by his lordship towards his late valet, Ellis, who was a great favourite of his master and with whom he had lived upwards of ten years. Ellis frequently went to the house to assist, and whenever he did so, he was liberally paid by his lordship. Ellis, having absented himself from the house for some days, his lordship ordered his valet, Corvazio, to desire Ellis to call. This mandate, however, the valet, Corvazio, neglected to do, from motives, it is said, of jealousy. The Trial The trial was a sensation. Apparent stolen goods were found in the possession of Quavazier. Quavazier was known to be upset by his perceived treatment by Lord Russell, and there were inconsistencies with his statements and the statements of the other servants. The jury retired for an hour and a half. They pronounced Quavazier guilty. Lord Chief Justice Tyndall and stated from the broadsides, You have been found guilty by the verdict of an intelligent, patient and impartial jury who have convicted you of the high crime of murder. You showed no compassion to your victim, but the justice which demands your life as a just sacrifice will indeed be much more merciful to you, who betrayed the trust, reposed in you, and felt no regard for the sacred duty you owed as a servant to a kind and benevolent master. Your offence is so apparent that an example must be made, for it has created a sensation an alarm almost unparalleled amongst those of us who use servants. Those who have heard your trial cannot, I think, have the least doubt of your guilt or the propriety of the verdict of the jury. It now only remains for me to pass upon you the sentence of the law, which is that you be taken to the jail from whence you came and from thence to a place of execution, and there to be hanged by the neck till you are dead, and that your body be buried within the precincts of the prison. And may Lord have mercy upon your soul. Corvazier's Confession Corvazier did eventually confess to the killing of Lord Russell, but no other crimes although he was asked. It would seem that Lord Russell had detected Quavazier stealing from him. From the broadsides, Quavazier stated that immediately after being detected by his lordship secreting the property he had stolen, he formed the resolution of murdering his master. For this purpose, he waited until, by his deep breathing, he was convinced his lordship slept. He then, divesting himself of his coat and turning up his shirt sleeves, took one of the carving knives and a towel and approached his lordship's bed. He then gently bared the unfortunate nobleman's neck and immediately drew the knife forcibly across it, which it thought at the moment had severed the head from the body. 
No sound whatever proceeded from his lordship, but a slight tremulous motion of the body. To prevent the blood from squirting forward at the moment he inflicted the fatal wound, he thrust the towel into the orifice he had made. The Execution On the morning of Monday, the 6th of July, 1840, Courvoisier was hanged before a crowd of about 30,000 people, including Charles Dickens, who responded intensely, saying he had never thought he could have felt any large assemblage of my fellow creatures to be so odious. Dickens' words describing the execution, it was so loathsome, pitiful, and vile a sight that the law appeared to be as bad as Quavazier, or worse, being very much the stronger and shredding around it a far more dismal contagion. Jack the Ripper copycat? Did Jack the Ripper copy the killing mode of the suspected Quavazier some fifty years later? Those who have been following our Whitechapel Wednesdays series may see similarities in the brutality and wounds inflicted in the first two murders. That concludes this episode of Mad, Bad and Dangerous to Know. We really hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, please subscribe and tell your friends. Subscribing really helps us. We are aiming for a thousand subscribers. There's no cost to you, and it really helps to support us. Just tap on the subscribe button that pops up if you haven't already subscribed. For our podcast listeners, you can see this podcast with the associated pictures on our YouTube channel at News of the Times. You can find the link in the show notes. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.